All right, it is my uh, great joy to um, introduce our speaker this evening. Joni Sobels grew up in Marina, graduated from Notre Dame High School in Salinas, and earned her degree in business marketing from Fresno State. She is a pastor's wife and the mother of five children, three of which have been launched, and the two that are still at home are in high school. She loves to hike the Toro Hills and is crazy for chocolate and blueberries. Joni became a widow at age 27. She is here tonight to share her testimony for the first time in such a public forum. She loves Jesus and prays that by sharing her testimony of God's faithfulness, others will come to know and follow Jesus too. Please join me in welcoming Joni Sobels. Do I have the be best friends in my life or what? You guys are so fun. <laughs> oh, well, this night has already been just so overwhelmingly good. Um, I'm officially in the Christmas spirit. Are you too? Yeah, it's been beautiful. Uh, my name is Joni Sobels. Thank you for inviting me to your Christmas celebration. Uh, I have a lot of respect for what's going on here at Shoreline Community Church. I love your push for organic outreach. I have a lot of respect for your leadership. Um, Pastor Kevin Harney and his wife Sherry are not only good friends of mine, but they are also my neighbors, literally my neighbors. We share a fence, so I get to see our, the, the lights are on on Saturday nights where the two pastors are studying hard, and I get to see when they turn their light out. And, uh, they make it very easy for me to love my neighbor. And Kim McDonald has become a really good, just a treasured friend very quickly. And so back in August, when she called and asked if I would give my testimony tonight at this program, my first thought was just, no, 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 please don't be asking me this. I do not want to talk about what's happened in my life. And I am not a public speaker. Um, but then before she even finished one or two sentences, my train of thought changed, and I started thinking, you know, Lord, if I could give one woman um, just hope, if, uh, if I could tell women that God is faithful and good, if I could remind women that weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning, then I want to do it. I really want to do it, and I know that I can't do it in my own strength, but I know that, that you could do it through me. So... I've never worn one of these before, and I don't know if that's working. Oh, th there we go. Okay, I feel a little like Garth Brooks or something, right? Um, uh, anyway, it was falling down, so I'm glad I fixed that. So anyway, so I am very glad to be here with all of you and celebrating. And uh, I think that he's brought each one of us here to hear something special. I think that each one of us, as women, we carry so much. And each one of us is carrying something that needs to be healed. And I just... Um, Pray that tonight that you can rest and just listen to maybe something that will encourage you. So would you please pray with me? Father God, we love you. We know that you are here in, your, in this room. Your Holy Spirit is moving here. Father, I pray for every woman here that you would give her rest tonight, that you would give each woman peace. Father, it is in our weakness that you are strong and so we're trusting you tonight to be our strength. I pray that you would warp the words that I speak so that each ear would hear just what they need to hear. And Father, we give you all the glory and we celebrate you. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So I have a photo here. I don't know if you can see that very well. That is um, me with the furry hair, the fuzzy hair. My hair's always been a problem. Um, I think... <laughs> Uh, that's my brother and sister and I on an Easter. I think I'm about three years old there. And um, I don't know if it was this Easter or the next Easter, but one of my earliest memories in life 
is being brought to church. I was raised in a very loving family, not a Christian family, but a very loving family. But when we went to, to church, it was a pretty big deal, and I think it was probably just Easter's and Christmases. And so at an early age, either three or four years old, I remember being brought into church and thinking, my father had said we needed to behave because we were going to the house of God. <laughs> and I remember thinking, once I got in there, thinking, this is the house of God? Like, this is the house of God? I just couldn't believe this is where God lives. And even at that young age, I was just thinking, I never want to leave here. Whatever was happening there, I just thought, I, I know that God loves me, and I know that I love him, and that I want to be with him all the days of my life. So big thoughts for a little child, but I remember that. That's one of my very first memories in life. When I was uh, nine years old, my family moved to a house in Marina that was across kind of kitty corner from a woman named Mrs. Canzoni. And she um, had a big sign in her garage window that said, Good News Club. And so on Tuesday afternoons, this precious woman would open up her home to anybody who would come in and uh, teach them about Jesus. And so I went there one Tuesday and saw that a lot of kids from my school were there. And Mrs. Canzoni would use, you know, the old felt boards, and she'd sing songs with us, and she'd make us jello jigglers. And I just thought that she was the most elegant woman that I had ever seen. She had a hairdo, you know, like one that you go to the beauty parlor every week and get done. I just thought that was so cool. And, um, and she would say, like the, her S's, she would say, not Jesus, she would say like, Jesus. You know, she had like this really pristine way of saying. So anyway, Mrs. Canzoni would tell us about Jesus. She told us that Jesus was the son of God. She told us that Jesus loved us. She told us that um, if we wanted him to be our savior, that we could just ask him and just that he would be. And I knew at nine years old that what Mrs. Canzoni said was true. I went home that day, I went into our bathroom, I closed the door and I knelt down in our little bathroom there and I asked Jesus to be the savior of my life. So I went through my life, that was about all I knew, but I knew um, that God loved me and I knew that I loved him. So I knew about God and I knew about Jesus, but I didn't really know know God, you know, and I didn't really know Jesus. So it wasn't until I was 20 years old, uh, I transferred to Fresno State as a junior, and I lived in the dorms there. And shortly after I moved in, I met one of the gals that lived on the floor with me. Her name was Laura. And Laura and I would run every night. There was three miles around the, the campus. And we would run together, and um, we would just talk about what was going on in our day. And I noticed that Laura would talk about Jesus a lot. And she, one day I, I turned to her and I said, um, you act like you know him. And she said, I do know him. And I thought it was blasphemous. I just thought that she, I, yeah, I just thought it was blasphemous. I actually got a little bit angry. And, um, and so anyway, when we went back to, her, to the dorms that night, I went into her room and she asked if she could pray for me. And... I said, sure, you can pray for me, but I thought she would pray for me when she went to bed that night. Isn't that when we all pray is when we go to sleep at night? But you guys know, she started praying for me right there. And I was so uncomfortable. And she was saying things like, um, God, would you reveal yourself to Joni? Would you show Joni who you really are? And when she stopped praying, I just remember there was tears coming down my face, down my eyes, and... Um, I had my hands up over my head, literally. And I said, do not ever do that again. God is holy, and I am not. Do never, never use my name in front of him like that again. And um, she said, Joni, you're right. He is holy, and you are not. But then she explained to me that that's why Jesus died on the cross, was so that I could have access to holy God Otherwise, I couldn't. So she took the time and she explained that to me. And that truth changed my life. The fact that I could actually be personal with holy God because of what Jesus had done on the cross, it all made sense to me. It was like a veil had been taken off my eyes and I knew that what she said was true. 
and my life changed. I went from an old life to a new life of pursuing Jesus on a daily basis, the way that she, the way that she modeled for me. And so one thing I would like to say, just kind of sidebar, for those of you who are sharing the gospel with people, don't be discouraged if they get angry, <laughs> if they want to stay away from you. Just stay steady. I am so thankful that Laura stayed steady with me because it changed my life. So the last semester of my senior year of college, I went to a tiny church and met a man named Joe Monzo. We fell in love and were engaged within a few weeks, uh, got married as quickly as we could find a church, pretty much. And uh, two years after that, we had our first son, Riley. And two years after that, we had our second son, Michael. And uh, we, well, Joe had a construction company here in Salinas. And I was able to work at home and be with the boys. And um, we just, I had never met anybody with such an authentic relationship with Jesus as Joe Monzo. He really just lived life um, honoring God. So we felt we were very in love, very blessed, very thankful. We adored our sons. We felt like we had all of our ducks in a row. Do any of you remember what you were doing Christmas 1991? I suppose maybe some of you weren't even born, but <laughs> Christmas 1991 was a watershed time for me. Uh, the week before Christmas, uh, Joe and I loaded up the boys, and we drove to Fresno to be with his family there. His grandfather had recently passed away, and so we felt like we just wanted to be with the family. And one of the things that I witnessed there that I will never forget is Joe sitting at his grandmother's feet, literally down at her feet. She was a new widow, and he just held her face, and he said, Nana, God loves you. He will never leave you. He is your constant companion. You can trust him. And I was standing in the room opposite, but I saw that, and I just thought, I have never seen such love. You know, it was just so beautiful. Well, we went back home that day. Oh, I think I actually have a second. Yeah, I'm forgetting my pictures here. That is a picture <laughs> of that day in Fresno at his father's house. Um, we had gone out and gotten ready to leave, but we had just gotten a camera that had a timer on it, and we thought we were awesome with our timer. And so, <laughs> so we ran back in the house and said, let's get this picture of the four of us. So we set our timer, and that is um, the four of us. And it makes me laugh because, uh, well, first of all, again, my hair. Sorry. <laughs> That's why I twist it up all the time. Um, but Joe had grown that mustache because he was only 25 years old here, and he had this great construction company, but nobody would take him seriously. And so, you know, they thought he was like 18, so he did that. Anyway, that's the four of us, and really the only family picture that I have of the four of us. Uh, so, anyway, that's fun to share with you guys. The night before Christmas Eve, I had gone to an ornament exchange with some of my girlfriends, and I came home about 9 o'clock, and um, Joe was there when I walked in, and said, hey, I just made a big bowl of popcorn. Come in, let's sit down. The boys are both asleep. Those times weren't very frequent, so we were very excited about that, and we, we spoke into the wee hour, like till maybe one o'clock at night, just talking and talking. Um, Joe would always have a sketch pad out, and he would write the things that we dream, dreamt about, and I had my journal, and I would write the things that I was, you know, we dream about, and so that's, it was that kind of a night where we were saying, what are your goals? What do you see for the future? Um, what do you see for ministry? What do you see God doing in our lives? So Joe went upstairs when we finally decided to go to sleep. Joe went upstairs, and I was down at the kitchen sink, and he walked back down the stairs. I heard him, and he came up behind me and grabbed my elbow in kind of a weird way, and he said, hey, Joan, anything ever happens to my head? Don't let them keep me on machines. And I said, oh, why did you say that? And he said, I don't, I'm not sure. I just felt like I needed to say that to you. And it wasn't completely out of context because we'd been talking about his grandfather passing away and just life issues, you know. But I still remember the chill from head to toe and just thinking I wish that he hadn't said that. It was very unsettling. The next day was Christmas Eve, and we loaded up the cars with, uh, with the, the car with five-month-old Michael and two-year-old Riley, and we headed towards Corral de Tierra, where my brother lived, and we were going to spend the, the holiday there. Uh, I was in the back seat between the two boys in their car seat, 
And we sang to the boys as we drove, and they, fell, they both fell asleep. And then as we merged onto Highway 68 near Partola, we're all very familiar with that, Joe said, I love you, Joan. And I put, reached out to put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, I love you too. And at that time, I looked, I looked up as I was reaching to put my hand on his shoulder from the back seat. And those would be the last words that we spoke to each other. As I told Joe that I loved him, I looked up and I saw a car coming right at us. It happened so fast that I did not have time to scream. But in that nanosecond of time, I saw this woman pull her steering wheel hard to the left, and then she put her hands up and leaned over to the, to the right to her passenger's uh, seat. And the car just came barreling across the double yellow lines, and it was as if she was in surrender. And it happened so fast, but I remember thinking, what is she doing? But I don't remember any sound, you know, any saying, any, saying anything. The next thing I knew, I was waking up in total darkness. I heard someone yell, stand back, it's going to blow. And then I was unconscious again. When I became conscious, uh, I was on the, highway, on the side of Highway 68, strapped to a board. My clothes had been cut. I saw that there were a lot of people around. From what I had been told, our cars hit twice and rolled twice, and I somehow was underneath. I had been ejected out the back window, was underneath, and they had to pull me out by my, by my feet. I remember that my face was freezing, my teeth were chattering, I could see that our sons had survived, uh, they were being held by women who were singing to them, I'll always be thankful for that. I could not see Joe, but I understood that somehow he was, he was behind me. I never saw the accident because I was strapped to that board, but it, everything was behind me. And the paramedics were telling me that your husband is telling, saying that he loves you and that he's fine. And I knew that it wasn't true because I knew his language and I knew that if he were able, he would say, are you okay? And are our sons okay? So I knew we were in trouble and I knew that I just needed to get to him somehow. I would uh, later learn that the young woman who hit us was fighting with her boyfriend. He was four cars ahead of her and they were playing cat, like chicken, you know, like cat and mouse. Pass, he'd pass her and then she'd pass him. And... They were going in and out of traffic, and eventually she resigned, and from what the CHP officers reported, she committed suicide by driving into oncoming traffic, which was us, our family. Her boyfriend later wrote a letter to me saying how sorry he was for our loss and that he didn't realize that she was so despondent, and I believed him. It was a horrific moment in time that would change all of our lives. I always wish that Joe could have spoken with this woman who hit us for five minutes before she crossed those double yellow lines. I have this picture in my mind that he would have held her face like he held his Nana's face, and he would have said, God loves you. He is with you. He is your constant companion. You can trust him. But sadly, short after, shortly after the accident, she died. Joe was taken to Valley Memorial, or Salinas Valley Memorial Hospital. The boys and I were taken to Community Hospital. Uh, miraculously, the physical injuries of the boys were minimal. Riley had a lot of glass in his scalp and in his ankles. Uh, Michael seemed to only have the tiniest speck of blood on his forehead. I will always praise God for their lives. I had 32 stitches across my forehead, broken ribs, broken nose, all kinds of other injuries, but all of those physical injuries would heal. I begged to be released from the hospital against the doctor's advice so that I could be with my husband. I kept thinking if I could just get to him, that we could figure this out together. Uh, I arrived at Joe's bedside seven hours after the accident, and by then, the feeling had returned to my body. Because uh, I don't think, I don't know if I mentioned, but at the, when I first woke up, I couldn't feel anything from my neck down. I just felt my teeth chattering and cold up here, but I couldn't feel anything from my neck down. Um, so it was about seven hours after the accident that I was taken over to uh, the other hospital. And the only thing I want to say about Joe's condition is that he was injured so badly that I would not have recognized him if it had not been for his wedding ring. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. He was on life support. Sorry, it's because you guys are so empathetic. When I hear the, the moans, I'm like, oh, that is sad. <laughs> 
I was fine until then. Um, but my, he was on life support. No, uh, no one should see the things that I have seen. I told everyone at the hospital to keep him on life support, that I would take care of him. God could raise the dead, and I was just sure of it. And as the severity of the situation began to sink in, I heard a sound that I'd never heard before. It sounded like the wailing of a wounded animal, and I realized it was me. There is a sound, a, a, a deep, guttural grief cry that I hope none of you ever have to hear. I do not believe God ever intended us to understand death. Death was never part of his plan. As I looked on in horror, a nurse came up behind me. I never saw her face. She was behind me. And I was in a wheelchair. I had all kinds of road debris and stuff in my hair. She pulled my hair back into a ponytail. And as she did, I remember her whispering into my ear and saying, Mrs. Monzo, you do not want to keep him on life support because of what's happened to his head. And I remembered that just the night before, Joe had said that exact sentence to me, Joan, if something ever happens to my head, don't let them keep me alive on machines. So I prayed silently. He was yours, God, before he was mine. If you're going to take him, take him now. <laughs> and he did. And... <laughs> Sorry. I brought my Kleenex. Hang on. Does anybody want one? <laughs> I brought an extra. There's two. Um, <laughs> I didn't know how this was going to go. I thought I was going to get through this. But, uh, but yes, as I prayed that, he, God did take him. And I knew without anyone telling me that Joe was gone. Joe had entered the gates of heaven on Christmas morning. And part of that brings me great joy because he was such a joyful person that I picture him like just bursting through the gates and just being like, where's the party? You know, so... It was Christmas morning. My life and my heart would never be the same. The excruciating, I know some of you probably know this, the excruciating separateness from my husband felt like more than I could bear, yet I had an overwhelming knowing that God was with me. These were undoubtedly holy moments. One of the few memories that I have from that first week after the accident is being at my parents' house. They were gracious to let us stay with them while we recuperated. And I overheard someone say, Joni cannot breathe without Joe. And I don't know, you know, I, I don't know what happened at that moment, but a decisiveness happened when I heard that. And I thought, no, no, no. I breathe because God has given me breath. I don't know why I survived. And it, sometimes I, I wish that I hadn't. But I knew that God wasn't done yet. And I knew that this needed to be about God's strength and not about my weakness. 2 Corinthians 12.9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's God's power. And I knew in that time of hearing that, that this could not be a story about my tragedy. This had to be a story about God's goodness. My life had changed, but God was still on the throne. He was still God. So I remember finding my way back into the bathroom, that same bathroom where I knelt when I was nine years old. And this was the darkest time of my life, yet I felt closer to God than ever before. I found myself worshiping God. I started praying and praising God in the corner of that little bathroom, me kneeling down, broken ribs, broken, eye, broken, uh, broken nose, black eyes, 32 stitches across my forehead, a 27-year-old widow, two babies without their daddy, yet I was worshiping. It wasn't from me. I would never have guessed that that's what would happen. But God met me in that place. No human can comfort the depths of that kind of grief, but God's presence can. I really want you ladies to hear that because we're all going to go through things, and God's presence will meet you wherever you are. I learned to take one day at a time. Sometimes it was just five minutes at a time. Sometimes the grief seemed paralyzing as I walked through those years. I will forever be in awe of God's mercy and grace on me and my sons. Well, years later, as the boys got older and went to school, preschool and kindergarten, 
I was working three jobs. I was working during the day. I was working bookkeeping at night at, at home, and I was doing catering on the weekends if I could. And I started praying very specifically that God, for God's provision. There were three things that I would pray about. I would say, Lord, you know that I need to be the breadwinner. Father, you know that I've always wanted to be at home with my boys. And third, I would love to be in ministry. But I didn't know how those could ever go together, but that was the cry of my heart. Well, Riley and Michael were at Monterey Bay Christian School. And uh, one day I went to pick them up, and the principal came out to meet me at the car. And he said, Joni, I've got this position open And you're the only one that comes to my mind. Every time I pray about this, you're the only one that comes to my mind. But it only pays $6 an hour. (laughs) And this was a while back, but still, $6 an hour. (laughs) And so I just said, you know, could I just pray about that for three days? Somehow that made sense to me. And as as I prayed about um, that position, I just realized that it would fulfill those three things that I had just started praying about. I would be the... Um, the breadwinner, not a lot of bread, but I would be making a wage. Um, I would be with my boys. They'd be in their classes, but I'd be with them, and I'd be in ministry. And so I took the job. And uh, that job ended up really changing my life. It was like a, a sweet little nest that I got to be in while I healed. I don't think the people around me knew that, but I knew it. And we never missed a meal, and we never missed a payment, and God always provided it. Never, the numbers never worked out on paper, but it always worked out. One of the fun stories I have from that is that the Friday before I started working on, you know, I was going to start on Monday. The Friday before, I had been in produce prior to that. And so I always wore jeans and sweatshirts because you're inside the coolers, in and out of the coolers all the time. And so that Friday, there was a knock at the door. An acquaintance of mine was standing there. And as I opened the door, she just started apologizing, saying, Joni, this is so weird, and I'm just so sorry that I'm doing this, but I've got these three hefty bags of of clothes. When I was praying this morning, God told me to bring you these clothes, and I don't want you to think that you need new clothes, and I don't want you to think I'm judging your clothes. And, you know, she just, like, profusely apologizing. And so so I was able to say, as I opened them up, everything fit perfectly. And I ended up wearing those clothes for years. And I was able to tell her, you will not believe this, but I'm starting a new job on Monday, and I need these clothes. I don't have clothes for this. We had so many stories of provision that, uh, that I, are just, it's miraculous, really. The boys saw the hand of God as they grew up, and they knew that God was the head of our household. I have people ask me how a tragedy like this could happen to a young family like ours. And the most comforting answer, I guess, that I've been given by God was one night early on in my grief, God gave me a dream. And in that dream, I was sitting in a schoolroom, uh, and Joe was sitting next to me, and there were people, other people that I didn't know in the classroom. And Jesus, this is a dream, Jesus walked through the door, and he said, many will come to know me, but one of you must go. And Joe, in my dream, Joe jumped up on the desk and said, let it be me. He loved Jesus so much, and he wanted people to know Jesus. And so it made sense to me. Uh, At his memorial service, the gospel was shared there, the truth about Jesus, and at least five people that I know of asked Jesus to be the savior of their life. Through that memorial service, one of them was his father, And his father ended up selling his businesses and going into full-time ministry and shared the love of Jesus with probably thousands of people. That dream gave me great comfort and purpose and reminded me that we are here, ladies, for a short amount of time. We are here to bring God glory and that our time here is short. And there is a much bigger picture going on in all of our lives than we understand an eternal plan. Do you know that for yourselves? Do you know that there's a lot more going on than you realize? When you're kind to somebody, that might spiral off to something that you never know about. Well, while I was working at Monterey Bay Christian School, I met a youth pastor 
who was funny and smart, and you probably know what's coming. He was very nice looking, and he had an Australian accent. And uh, got a, we had a new principal that year who assigned every staff member to teach at a chapel. The following year, not that year, but the following year, and I was so afraid of public speaking, go figure, <laughs> that I called this youth pastor and asked him if he would do my chapel a year in advance. <laughs> and when he, ans- when he said, now who is this? And I said, it's Joni, Joni Monzo. And, and he said, and when do you want me to do this? And I said, next year. And, and he said, well, I, he said in his Australian accent, I'll do it as if I'm not in hospital. And so was, I don't know, I just remember him saying that, and I thought that was really fun. I'm like, please don't let him be in the hospital. Please let him do it. So, so uh, who could imagine that this would be the man that I would eventually marry? <laughs> Carolyn Lachey and, and Rosie back there. I, there are a lot of women in this room, I think, that prayed me into this marriage. And I thank you for it. I thank you. Uh, we are, I have three more children now, and life is very full with this man. Ben is in South Sudan right now as we speak, teaching other people how to teach the Bible, and a lot of good stuff is happening over there. And I get to be in ministry with this wonderful man with our five kids, and a lot of stuff going on. There's never a dull moment with Ben Sobels, and I am very grateful. And Ben is now the senior pastor at Cypress Community Church, and yeah, I'm very thankful that I get to serve alongside him. It's an honor to serve with him, and... Uh, He was worth waiting 16 years for. (laughs) 16 years. 16 years. If you ladies are in a wilderness time right now, if you are in a season where you feel like God is not answering your prayers, wait. Wait until he does. Do not settle for second best. You know, wait. Wait for his plan to unfold. I have a third family photo here. This is us now. Riley and Michael, those precious boys of mine, uh, are all grown up now and are two of the coolest men I've ever known. (laughs) They have had so much grace on me. I've made so many mistakes. I never knew if what I was doing was right. Uh, Riley is now 26 years old. He's getting married in February to a beautiful, godly woman who's here, Chesley. I'm so thankful. Oh, now that's what's going to make me cry. Isn't that crazy? (laughs) The good stuff makes me cry. Oh, Michael is 24, he lives in Kauai, and he will be home for Christmas, and that makes me cry too, I can't wait to get my hands on this kid. Um, and I've got beautiful Sarah and John and Annie, who are uh, all taller than me now and thriving, and I just praise God for his continued faithfulness. Some of you might be thinking that your life hasn't turned out the way you thought it would. You might feel like I did, like the rug got pulled out from underneath you. Somewhere along the way, your plan got turned upside down. I would like to share a few very practical things with you that got me through those 16 years of wilderness and honestly still get me through. Missionary Elizabeth Elliot used to say that every day we should do four things. We should pray. We should be in God's word. We should tell God we'll do anything he asks us to do and then just do the next thing. And that advice has gotten me through a lot. So pray. Pray as if God is with you because he is. And read the word daily because it's your food. If you do not have a Bible, please let me know. Shoreline has provided plenty of Bibles. If any of you need one, we want you to have one. And may I just say, don't just read books about the Bible. Read the Bible. It's his love letter to you. There's no no substitute for actually getting in the word. Tell God you'll do anything he asks you to do. We are here to celebrate Christmas, the birth of Jesus. The Son of God came to earth as a baby, born in the most humble circumstances, yet is the King of Kings just like the scriptures predicted. 
That is worth celebrating. And there's more. Christ died for our sins, just like the scriptures said he would. He was buried and then he was raised on the third day, just like the scriptures predicted. And he appeared to over 500 people after that resurrection. Romans 10 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confess, repent, believe, and follow Jesus. Jesus heals broken hearts. He heals the brokenhearted. He is compassionate. He lifts up those who are bowed down. He reigns forever for all generations. If you do not know Jesus, let this be the night that you say, Lord, let your will be done. I give you my life. Pray tonight to receive Jesus as your Savior. There will be women up here who will pray with you, or maybe you just want to do like I did when I was nine years old. Go find a quiet place and ask him to be the Lord of your life. But don't wait. Let it be tonight. You can trust him. He is faithful. He is worthy. He delights in you. Let's pour out the love and truth of Jesus in this dark world, ladies. Let's pour out the love of Jesus into this world. This is not a time to be passive about your faith. This is not a time to be passive about Jesus. Say his name when you can. Tell people that he is the savior of the world. It's the truth. He is the one true God and the savior of the world. I feel like I have so much more I want to say, but, but it's just um, been an honor to spend this time with you and to celebrate Christmas with you. And I pray that this Christmas, that each of you know him as Emmanuel, God with us. And please do come up for prayer if you want prayer. If there's that stirring in your heart right now and you're thinking, I, I want to go up, but I don't really, I don't want anybody to see me, just come up. Come up and get prayer. There are women here who are eager and have been preparing for you to come up forward. And give your life to Christ tonight if you haven't already. So thank you, and again, just Merry Christmas. Yeah.